everybody. Beaming live to you via the satellites from the Connecticut River Delta. Welcome back to another live stream Q&A session. I had a banjo handy. So I thought, open up our show with a little banjo playing today. Why not, right? Why not? A beautiful banjo, approximately 100 years old. Uh, not every part, but the neck, the neck here, the wood itself, and what they call the pot, the actual metal body, about 100 years old, uh, made in the Chicago area uh, from the uh, Nelson Banjo Company. And it's stamped on the back, H.C. Nelson, Chicago. Lots of replacement parts. All the tuning machines have been replaced. The actual metal uh, screws here, the brackets have all been replaced, but not the metal body, you know. Uh, the drum head here, the banjo head has been replaced. New bridge, uh, new uh, tailpiece, new uh, saddle. Um, by new, I mean about 20 years old, but it's a hundred year old banjo, man. Anyways, the five string banjo, technically four and a half strings. I don't know. I was thinking of you guys. I thought I'd grab it, play a little tune in what they call the claw hammer style, also known as the mountain style. Who doesn't like the banjo? Uh, so, who's out there, man? Give me a second to say some hellos, and then we'll get into your questions. Okay, who is here? Beginner Guitar, our moderator is here. Hello, Beginner Guitar, welcome. Steven, welcome. Harmonica and Guitar Progress. How you doing? Bob, Bob, uh, Bob in Nation. Am I saying that right, Bob? Hey, welcome. Uh, Scott Rhodes, I see a bunch of familiar names. Everybody, Johnny Midnight. Hey, Johnny Midnight. David Belcher, hello. Jerry Dashel, everybody, yeah. Welcome, everybody. Okay, so you guys, I can't wait to get to your questions. Uh, don't forget, put a couple of question marks in advance so I know the question is for me. Now, you might have a question for the group, and that's not directed as me, at me. That's great. Then you do not have to put the question marks in advance. Uh, but if you've got something on your mind regarding the guitar, specifically some that you think I might be able to help you with, I'm happy to be involved with that question. Uh, as usual, I have my show and tell on the up on the big board ahead of me here. So there's a bunch of things I want to talk to you about. So on my agenda today, as well as your own questions coming to me, my agenda today involves uh, a little more time on the circle of fifths. Not much, but a little bit more. Uh, I have some more books to recommend for you. Uh, I want to, you know, my wife had a brilliant idea, which is to let you know how you could take lessons from me. Because <laughs> I come home from work and I say to my wife, ah, my, my Monday mornings, man, I don't have any students on Monday mornings. And she says, hey, Mr. Smart Guy, why don't you tell your live stream people on Saturday about what you have available for online lessons? And that's very smart. So I'm going to get to uh, some of that if today if some of you guys are interested in doing online lessons with me. As usual, I want to uh, plug a guitar player or two who are maybe well-known among the guitar community, but maybe not uh, on the forefront of your minds. I always like um, um, you know, spreading the good word about talented, talented people who are out there that you may not have heard of, um, but people who are well worth checking out. Okay, so let's get down to your questions, everybody. Let's do this thing. Okay, I'm looking for some good guitar questions. Uh, what do we got? Hey, music fan. <laughs> Dashiell, I pronounced your name right in the first try. Well, Dashiell Hammett, the famous writer, right? You know, hey, Dan, North Country Fisher, welcome. Hey, Mr. Collier, thank you for joining us, Bill, all the way from Texas. Uh... Dan, let's jump in with Dan says, are we still talking and learning about John Prine? Yeah, any, um, we hit John Prine's name came up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what can I tell you about John Prine's guitar playing? From, by his own admission, he was not an advanced guitar player. He's a songwriter. You don't have to be a fantastic guitar player. It doesn't, you know, it might even get in the way. You might be so busy worried about your guitar, you know, 
complexity that you forget to write a great song. I suppose that could happen. John Prine did not have that problem. Um, so uh, I don't have, I have exact, well, let me think. Actually, you know what I have for you guys on YouTube? I have a good video on how to play a famous John Prine song called In Spite of Ourselves. So if you, uh, since uh, Dan brought up um, uh, John Prine's name here, if you guys are so inclined, I can recommend that video highly just here on my YouTube channel. Um, the song is called In Spite of Ourselves. It has a nice guitar intro, a finger picked intro that's not easy, except in the grand scheme of guitar finger picking, it's easy. But if you've never done any finger picking before, or if you just have done some rudimentary finger picking, the introduction to In Spite of Ourselves by John Prine would make for a great uh, workout. You know, give yourself, a, a, you know, I would, I would venture to say a couple weeks of work to get that intro down. Um, and I think I have a John Prine video on how to play Angels, uh, Angel from Montgomery. I'm pretty sure I do. Uh, so real quick before we move on. Um, to learn a handful of John Prine songs would give you a good foundation in, uh, in, in how to accompany a singer, how to, how to play, you know, decent accompaniment, whether um, bare fingers, which he did, John Prine did plenty of bare finger picking, um, or strumming with a pick. <clears throat> Someone told me, was it one of you guys, that John Prine only used his thumb and his pointer? That could be. Even if he did, I would not recommend it for you guys because if you're starting out with finger picking, the sooner you get multiple fingers involved, the better. Even though it's nice to be able to say, hey, I'm playing it exactly like the guy plays it. Yeah, there's a grain of truth there. But um, I would recommend using multiple fingers. Well, now that I think about it, <clears throat> no, I guess I guess he could have done that. I don't know. But if I were to teach you any John Prine song, I would not limit you to only a thumb and an index finger, even if it seemed like he might be doing that. Yeah, he might as well get everything involved. Okay, questions, questions. Let's keep them coming here. Uh, mm, hey, Walter, uh, welcome. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, oh, David is asking, have I decided on what new guitar I'm gonna order now that my, my Fender Custom Shop guitar was not made to order. I won't, I, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not gonna tell this story again, don't worry, but or, or I'll tell you a very quick version of the story. I ordered a guitar from the Fender Custom Shop and uh, by the time they finally made it and sent it to me, they got the specifications wrong, long story short. And um, so ultimately I sent it back. That's the short version. There's a lot more to it, that's a short version. Okay, so I have actually been looking at different makers um, especially makers not too far where I live, uh, from where I live. And here's why. There are, I'm sure, fantastic guitar makers all over the country, all over the world. I really would like to visit the workshop, try some of the instruments, and, um, and then make a decision, you know. So I live in the glorious state of Connecticut, USA. Uh, so I've been looking at different makers around um, Massachusetts, Boston, and, and outside, of Mass outside of Boston. And uh, of course, there's makers in New York, um, and there's plenty. There's enough there to uh, to keep me busy. So I'll keep you posted. But I've certainly found some some talented, talented people who make things that are out of my budget <laughs> for sure, and also make guitars that just might be in my budget. Um, so yeah, shopping is the fun part, right? Um, I could shop forever, as my wife will tell you. I could sit on the sofa and scroll and scroll and scroll and. Uh, so I'll keep it posted. Okay, uh, moving on, moving on. <laughs> yeah, Charlie does not see that new pink Telecaster. I know, Charlie, I know. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, Dasho says, <clears throat> any tips on learning to play electric blues with fingers or finger picks instead of a pick? That's how, to my knowledge, a lot of the first generation electric bluesmen played. Um, great question. Uh, <clears throat> so... Let me see. In terms of suggestions, and this is specifically on electric guitar. Um, uh, 
I don't know if I have any specific suggestions, but I have some, some comments or maybe some advice. Anybody on any type of guitar who begins using a, a, a plastic thumb pick, which is the most conventional material that a thumb pick is gonna be made out of, and metal finger picks, which is the most common material for finger picks to be made out of. Anybody who plays any guitar wearing those, there's gonna be a period where it just doesn't feel right. Um, the plus side is it gets such a sharp, crisp, loud sound, a very distinct sound, it's great. Then the negative is that you are removed from the strings. You know, the intimacy that you could have had from your bare fingertips touching the strings is gone. And, and so that's the price you pay for that nice crisp sound. So if you are so inclined to follow in the footsteps of some excellent players who wear plastic and metal picks on their fingers, um, uh, just, just be aware that you, you're gonna feel clumsy at first. Um, that's okay. You know, our Freddie King, favorite of mine and a favorite of zillions of blues guitar players, uh, to my knowledge, wore a, a finger pick, I believe made out of plastic. Um, and I believe one metal finger pick on one finger. Um, and uh, so uh, you get a, a very distinct, awesome sound, but it feels clumsy at first. Okay, that's true for electric guitar, acoustic guitar, either way. Um, if you went with bare fingers, you lose that crisp butt, that crisp sound, but you can feel, it's almost like you're, you're, you can feel the strings better. You, it, it's, it's great to play with your bare fingers. You know, that intimacy is right there. Plus, uh, just like we all have uh, our unique fingerprints, no one's fingers are like your fingers. And if you want to sound distinctive, what's more distinctive than your fingers? I was reminded today of yet another talented electric guitar player who did not use a pick, Robbie Krieger from The Doors. So let's add to our list of <laughs> people who played electric loud guitar without using a pick. Robbie Krieger from The Doors, Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits, Hubert Sumlin, one of my favorite uh, blues guitar players, played with Howlin' Wolf. Hubert Sumlin played electric guitar without using a pick. Lindsey Buckingham from Fleetwood Mac, same thing. Um, now these guys are in the minority, um, but they make a pretty good case for never using a pick. So, uh, in, um, Dasho, getting back to your specific question, do I have any tips on learning to play? Um, be patient if you are using thumb and finger picks that for that slightly clumsy feeling, it's gonna sound that way at first. Uh, if you're, if anybody is playing the guitar without using a, a proper regular plastic finger pick, I mean, sorry, regular pick, where'd I put my pick? It's around here somewhere. Uh, you have decisions to make. For instance, technically we have five picks here, right? So you go to play some cool little thing, well, well which finger are you gonna use? Um, if you are holding a pick like a regular picking guitar player, you, you don't have that decision to make. So this is not exactly helpful, Dashiell, but um, choose wisely about which thumb or finger you're gonna use when you're playing, when you're executing any blues thing and, and be consistent. Uh, there's more than one right way to do anything on the guitar. I mean, as long as it sounds good, it's good. Um, but uh, if you want to sound better faster, you got to stay consistent. That's a, a rule to live by no matter what. Um, so am I, am I helping you a little bit? I don't know. Those are, those are my initial reactions. I do not discourage you from doing that, though, from, from playing without, uh, without a, a plastic pick. You mentioned, you said, that's to my knowledge, that's how a lot of the first generation electric bluesmen played. Um, you, you, you may be right. I'm sure there's lots of examples. I haven't gone to school on, on that exact detail. How many first generation electric blues players played with a plastic flat pick? How many played with bare fingers? And how many used some combination of a thumb pick and finger picks? I, it's a great, I mean, I wish I knew. And, and those, that information is out there. Uh, and there's advantages to all that stuff. And I'm sure the most expert among the, the modern day blues players can do all of the above. I bet, and they channel each, 
guitar player, say Hubert Sumlin, and say, oh, I'm gonna, let's, I'm gonna do a Howlin' Wolf song and I'm gonna channel Hubert Sumlin, therefore I'm gonna put down my pick, I'm gonna play with bare fingers. And then next song they channel someone else and say, oh, I know for a fact this guy played with a pick, I'm gonna channel that guy and grab my pick and play that way. So um, that's the ideal. Okay, let's keep these questions coming on in. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Looking for those question marks before the questions. North Country Fisher, hello. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, North Country Fisher says, I finally bought an amp, a cheapo amp, for my electric guitar. The clean tone, the cleans are fantastic, but the overdrive is awful, very noisy. Is that normal for a beginner? Um, the... If you're saying that the overdrive channel, the distorted channel on the amp is not a pleasing sound to your ear, um, yeah, that's that that just probably means you have good taste. <laughs> um, uh, but it doesn't mean you bought a bad amp um, necessarily. It just means you know, yeah, you you that's that's why people pay bigger bucks for fancier amps. It doesn't mean though that there aren't solutions. Uh, um, buy a pedal. I don't have my pedals handy. I tell you what I like though, I'm not a pedal expert. And because I'm not a pedal expert, uh, um, I tend to trust, there you go. I tend to trust the conventional stuff that's out there. Um, so uh, the Boss company makes great stuff that's not particularly expensive, Boss pedals. They're pretty reliable, um, as far as I can tell. I see professionals using Boss pedals all the time. And there's a Boss distortion pedal overdrive, whatever you want to call it, uh, called the Blues Driver. So if you put that in your chain, right, you plug your cable into the Blues Driver, get a second cable out of the Blues Driver into your, uh, into your amp, um, I bet you like that distorted sound a lot better than the one that was built into the amp. And, and I guess they go for about a hundred bucks ballpark. Um, so uh, that, that I, I would bet that takes care of it. Now you might've only paid a hundred bucks for the amp and here I am saying, Hey man, for another hundred, you can get this, this pedal. Um, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to the, the world. The good news is you may sell that amp someday, but you'll still have the pedal. And uh, I can tell you the blues driver, it did my heart good because I was in, uh, Woodstock, New York. Um, this is a bunch of years ago, many years ago now. <clears throat> um, I went up to see Levon Helm and his band when they were doing those midnight rambles. Some of you might know about what I'm talking about. Levon Helm, drummer and singer and founding member of the band called The Band. And uh, before he passed away, he was hosting regular uh, concerts at his uh, barn, at his home in Woodstock, New York. And I was lucky enough to go to one of those. And um, Larry Campbell, who is another familiar name. In fact, while I'm talking about guitar players, you guys should all know about, check out Larry Campbell. Larry Campbell was playing with, with uh, Levon Helm, and I could see Larry Campbell's uh, pedal board right in front of me because it's a small venue, and there was a blues driver. And I thought, wow, even Larry Campbell uses a blues driver um, because they sound great, they're reliable. And my guess is that if you buy a blues driver in Los Angeles and you go on tour with it and somewhere in Chicago, it breaks, it dies, whatever, buy another one, put it in your, on your pedal board and you're back in action again. No surprises. No. Okay. So North County Fisher, that is my advice to you. Um, here's some advice in general for those of you who are playing electric guitar, or even if you're playing acoustic guitar that you plug in acoustic electric, and you're shopping for FX pedals, uh, here's my advice to you. Have someone else, a friend, a salesperson, have them play through the pedal while you stand five or 10 feet away. 100% game changer. You're gonna sit with a couple of pedals that say you're shopping for a distortion pedal, and they're gonna sound pretty good. They're gonna sound okay. They're gonna sound the same as each other. Have someone else play the guitar. You step 10 feet back, you'll hear Assuming there's any difference between the two pedals you're, you're checking out, that is exactly how you'll hear the difference between the two pedals. I had that experience and it made, I, I could choose, I happen to choose the blues driver. I could make my decision in a second. As soon as I heard 
from, from a little bit of a distance, you know. So a little pedal shopping advice. Uh, um, so North County Fisher, welcome to the world on uh, welcome to the world of of amplified electric instruments. Um, so, okay, let's see, let's see who else we have here. Uh, Walter, glad you could make it. Usually you're at work and you miss these. You got it. Um, I'm glad you could make it. Quick reminder, folks. Uh, all we, this is our our eighth live stream, and. Uh, all seven previous ones have been recorded, available on my YouTube channel. I believe when you're at my YouTube channel, I believe you have to click on the tab that says live to access these, these videos. Um, I also have a playlist that's called, you know, the live stream question and answer playlist. The most recent live stream last Saturday, I have not finished doing the time stamp. I think I did the first hour so far. Sorry, I haven't gotten to the second hour, but I will. Um, time stamp, in case you don't know, um, makes it easy for you to listen to a previous or watch a previous um, live stream and go directly to a question that interests you without having to watch all two hours, you know? And so that, that information is in the description of each live stream video. And I will do a time stamp on this one too. Okay. Um, hey, harmonica and guitar progress. Oh, how you read my mind, harmonica and guitar progress. Okay, harmonica and guitar progress says, I know a guy named Trevor Healy who makes Healy guitars in Massachusetts. He's my repair guy. Okay, you ready for this? Look what I've been drooling over. Can you see that? Hold on. There it is, a Healy guitar. You read my mind, harmonica and guitar progress. That's a Healy guitar. Uh, the, the company, H-E-A-L-Y, Healy Guitars, out of Massachusetts, maybe about a 90-minute drive from where I live. Um, they make some pretty sweet-looking stuff. I just put the name of that company in the chat. And, uh, yeah, they might be a little bit out of my price range, um, but maybe I can, you know... Uh, Keep saving. But yeah, so that's, you read my mind. Healy guitars look very cool. He makes a model, that model is called the Growler. And you know, when a guitar makes it onto my my lock screen on my phone, that's that's high praise. <laughs> I mean, about every few days I change it, but recently I'm like, wow, a Healy Growler. Very cool. So next time you see Mr. Healy, um, you feel free to, to tell him I, I would love to come in and check out what he does. I've been following him on social media and stuff. Okay, uh, scrolling everybody, bear with me. Keep those questions coming in. Looking for those question marks. Um, Dan, you're talking about is spaced repetition learning. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Dan, uh, you just, I, I like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dan, you're talking about a practice technique. Um, and, and one thing you mentioned is taking a small a measure or a small phrase and doing it a whole bunch of times um, and come back and add another measure. It's a great attitude. Let's face it, folks, it, it takes a lot of patience to get, to get good at anything, right? And the guitar is no exception. If if you have if you're patient with yourself and you you go easy on yourself, then no one can stop you. I mean, you're going to be as good as you're going to be. Uh, all I can tell you is that the only way I learn stuff is doing it a thousand times, breaking something into individual phrases, individual measures. That's the only way I, I've learned anything on the guitar. Um, so I'm going to assume that for most of you, that's that's how you're going to learn too. Whether whether we like it or not, um, that that's you know, we all see on YouTube a six year old who can do amazing things who apparently did not have to go through that type of learning curve. And what can I say? I, I don't get hung up on that. Just don't don't. You can say, "Wow, that six year old's amazing," and then move on with your life. Otherwise, you, you're going to think yourself into a, a death spiral of why a six-year-old can do something that you can't do. And that's, it's not healthy, it's not productive, 
And you're never going to wrap your head around it anyways. There's no answer. I can't tell you why a six-year-old or a nine-year-old can play some great stuff. I don't know. So, but, I, but you got to move on with your life, right? So bottom line is, um, Dan, I, I, like how, I like how you're thinking. Um, number one, you have to have a practice philosophy. And it, it can be a, it can be a expansive, inclusive practice philosophy that can include work on one measure for five minutes, 20 minutes. That's, that's, that can be a, a good approach. And, and, you know, um, and then working on an entire tune and playing it, just playing it through and trying to get a flow going, despite the fact that not every measure sounds perfect. That, that's, that's not a bad idea. Um, here's where I'm coming from. When all is said and done, we all should practice every day in a perfect world, right? The, the, the things that get in the way of that are uh, responsibilities, work, you know, family, I mean, you know, responsibilities, right? But the other thing that gets in the way of that is, is your own uh, frustration, hangups, like, ah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sit down to practice and I sound bad. So therefore, why sit down and practice, right? Or, or whatever little negative thought. <clears throat> Sadly, I cannot help you with your adult responsibilities, but I, I can address to some extent the psychological barrier that, that might be in your way to practicing every single day or at least every opportunity you have. Um, I can tell you that the guitar isn't easy and things do take a ton of um, repetition. And if something is taking you a lot of time or doing it over and over again to get a little bit better, yeah, good, you're normal. That's a sign that you're normal. That's how we all do it, you know? Uh, I can suggest um, if you're getting hung up on one song or one skill or one thing um, and it's keeping you from enjoying your practice time, pick something else, put that aside for a little bit, pick something else. There's always something new and something valuable. I'm not just talking about some random song, like having A, D, D and jumping from song to song to song. I'm talking about, hey, if you're hung up on bar chords and getting upset with yourself, there's so many, there are so many other things that you should be working on making progress that have nothing to do with bar chords. And I'm, I'm using bar chords specifically because if there's one thing that I see my students getting hung up on or people who come to me for lessons um, that they're hung up on is it's bar chords. So, you know, if that is keeping you from enjoying your practice time so that even when you have an opportunity to practice, you, you're not really looking forward to, you might choose to do something else. Yeah, put, put that thing aside pick something else, you know? Um, and I'm full of suggestions as to what that something else could be. I, all those books behind me are full of things. Okay, uh, moving on folks. In a minute, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a break from your questions and, uh, and throw some information your way. Okay, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, Derek Trucks, David Belcher is adding a couple of names for people who do not use picks. Derek Trucks and Stanley Jordan. Sure, sure. Um, and notably, uh, both electric guitar players, right? I have no doubt that they can play acoustic guitar, but when you go see the, you know, the Derek Trucks, Susan Tedeschi band in concert, he's playing electric guitar, right? And sweet SG, right? Uh, so again, it's slightly unusual to have an electric guitar player playing without some sort of uh, plastic pick. I'm not saying no one does. I'm just, let's add Derek Trucks to the list. Uh, uh, a big reason why I bet Derek Trucks would choose not to use a pick. He's playing slide guitar and slide guitar. I'm not saying you can't mix playing with a plastic pick and slide guitar, but it's it's really common for slide guitar players on acoustic or electric guitar to use to, to not use a plastic flat pick. Okay. Uh, what else do we got here? Checking out, checking out. Hey, Dwayne, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, Dwayne is back. Dwayne, uh, thank you for uh, for joining us. Uh, Dwayne is our cardiac surgeon. If you have a question for Dwayne, put a heart emoji first. Uh, Dwayne, any new tips on how to get better at fingerstyle guitar? <clears throat> um, I'll give you some tips and we'll see what are new tips to you, right? Sure. 
fingerstyle guitar. If only I had a guitar handy. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the right hand. Uh, although a quick tip for, for people pursuing fingerstyle guitar with your fretting hand, um, it's really common to not necessarily hold down an entire chord. If you're playing, you know, fingerstyle, even if the music says hold down a certain chord, very often you can get away with without holding down the entire chord because you're not literally plucking all those strings. I'm using G specifically as an example. I can definitely think of multiple times when I'm finger picking a G chord, but I'm only fretting the fat E string. I'm gonna scooch closer to mic a little bit here. See my one finger G with my left hand there? I'm not doing this because I'm lazy. It's sort of in a matter of you know efficiency. Maybe I'm zipping around between different chords. Here's my C chord. And it's time to go to G. I don't want anything to interfere with my progress from a C chord to a G chord. So in terms of tips for your fretting hand, just be aware of that, of times where you don't necessarily have to hold down the whole chord. If you do, you do, that's fine. Um, but take advantage of those moments when, or at least consider the option of not holding up uh, the complete chord if you don't have to. Uh, in terms of um, picking tips, I can't emphasize enough to staying relaxed. If you are finger picking, keep your, not just your fingertips relaxed, but consider, you know, really your neck on down as relaxed as your right arm can be. Um, even if it means the sound is going to be a little bit softer, think light and quick with your right hand. It's not just by thinking, mentally telling yourself, oh, yeah, I'm going to play light and quick with a, with a relaxed hand. Just by thinking that, you are sending a message to your body, uh, to, your, to your right hand, that will help you play faster. Especially if you're working on a pattern, but you have to go fast, you have to do the pattern quickly. You, you can't have any tension in your hand. Um, think light and quick. Okay, other, uh, other finger picking tips, um, and forgive me if you know these already. In general, your thumb is responsible for the three fat strings when you finger pick, in general, E, A, and D. And in general, your index is responsible for the G string, the third string, middle finger responsible for the B, the second string, and ring finger responsible for the high E, skinny E string. There's exceptions to this, but you know, in the you, you want to start with that orientation as a framework and then uh, modify it as you see fit. But that's I really recommend starting with that as your framework, <clears throat> as your orientation. The last thing you want to do is guessing which finger goes where or doing it mindlessly and doing it a song or pattern differently every time you play it with just some random combination of, of right hand fingers because uh, you're never going to make progress. Like I said earlier, um, being consistent is absolutely directly related to the progress that you're going to make. Other finger picking tips, um, you know, you consider growing out your fingernails a little bit, you know, on your on your uh, picking hand. Um, last week when I played Freight Train, uh, my my fingernails were a little bit longer. And when I listened to the playback, I could hear I could hear a kind of pronounced uh, treble strings every time I, I my longer fingernail plucked the treble string. I thought, ooh, wow, that's a little bit louder than I intended. Um, other finger picking tips in in general um my final tip is going to be uh learn pattern picking first and then move to you could call it travis picking um mississippi john hurt style picking um that song freight train where it's not just a pattern you're producing a melody so just in case you guys don't know what i'm talking about here's a pattern what song is this? It's not a song. It could be used for accompanying a singer. It's just a pattern. If you do a pattern and you change chords, it sounds great. 
What song is this? It's not a song. I'm just changing chords while I keep this pattern going. That's how you start, right? You start with, and there's a bunch of patterns. Where's my book? Where's my show and tell? <clears throat> patterns, okay? <clears throat> if you want to know what I was just doing, there's a whole bunch of patterns like that in this book. Okay. Uh, as you get more and more comfortable with those, as you get comfortable with more and more of those patterns, then you make the next step, like freight train, where you keep that alternating thumb going, but introduce melodic notes with your remaining fingers. I know it's a little bit quiet. Okay, just another tip. Patterns first, pattern picking gets your hand confident, competent, uh, and then that's a good, that's a mandatory foundation to doing the fancier stuff. Okay, excellent question. Scrolling up, my friends. Oh, oh, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to uh, talk about my agenda for a minute. My agenda today, in the live chat, I asked the poll question, uh, and please do answer this question because uh, it could affect some stuff that I do moving forward. Probably the best-selling method book, um, I'm guessing, because it just seems that way. I know I've sold a million copies of this book in different music stores that I've worked in. Um, so do you want to copy this book? Because if you do, <laughs> it's extremely likely that you own a copy but have not done the whole book. Um, I feel a lot of people get this. They do the first couple pages and they... Uh, because this book is, what this book does, and everybody for, uh, this is the Hal Leonard Guitar Method Book One. Okay, uh, it teaches you how to read music, which is great. We all should learn how to read music. I'm glad that I know how to read music. Uh, it's not the most exciting book in the world, which is why I'm guessing that many people buy it for, it's, it's up to 15 bucks now. They buy it, they do a few pages and they realize, uh, you know, the, a bunch of the books that I have written have essentially been a reaction to the failures of this book. It sounds so harsh, but it's, I shouldn't say that. The, the, you know, this book is not the be all and end all for beginning guitar, but uh, many of you might own this book because you bought your first guitar and you said to someone, what's a good beginner book? And they hand you this because it, it's, it's, an, it's an okay beginner book, but it, for most of you, it didn't get you what you wanted. So my point is, how many of you out there have a copy sitting around somewhere of the Hal Leonard Guitar Method Book One? Because what I would like to do is show you how to hack this book. If you already own a copy of it and you've made a little progress in it, um, let's get your $15 worth um, out of this book and have some fun with it because that I can, I can do. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, second thing today, I plugged an author last week who I love, and that was the, the guitar book author named Dave Rubin. And so today I'm, I'm spreading the wealth here with another book author that I love. I have at least four copies of books written by Fred Sokolow. And I, if I looked, I could probably find another four or five copies, if not more. Fred Sokolow, I pronounce his last name wrong, I bet. Sokolow. S-O-K-O-L-O-W, Fred. Fred, he is one of my absolute favorite authors. He's written so many cool books. Currently in my hands, I'm holding four books by him, including The Roots of Electric Blues Guitar, Classic Rock Instrumentals. Also written by him, The Guitar of Doc Watson. Also written by him, a transcription book of Chuck Berry sucks. See how worn out that Chuck Berry book is? Yeah. Um, so anyways, my number one message to you is any book with the name Fred Sokolow on the cover, get that book, especially if the topic seems kind of interesting to you. Yeah, man. You know, some people are just plain good at their jobs, and he is one of them. Um, I've used just about all these books in my teaching, with the one exception of this Doc Watson book, which I just got. I happen to find this at a used bookstore for $4. I could almost cry. Uh, it's about 
15 Doc Watson tunes documented note for note for $4. I can barely get a coffee for $4. And this is, if not a lifetime of work, months and months and months of fun work learning Doc Watson songs. Oh, it even comes with pictures. Anyway, okay. I just want to spread his name. I'm going to put it in the chat. Any book you ever see by Fred Sokolow, Sokolow, get it. Okay, and I'm putting his name in the chat here. Okay, one more book at the moment. I have plenty of things to suggest. A book written by my friend, Paul Neary, lives uh, just in the next town over from me here in Connecticut. The book is called The Acoustic Guitar Repair Detective, published by How Leonard Publications. What an awesome book. You can get it from Amazon. Um, Paul has been a guitar luthier for many years. He does all the work on my guitars. Uh, sometimes it's kind of embarrassing because I know how I broke the guitar, but I don't want to admit to him how I broke the guitar or how I neglected the instrument. And he doesn't ask too many questions, but he does a great job fixing my mistakes. Um, and a couple of years ago, he wrote this great book that's based on his experience with decades and decades and decades of fixing guitars for people. Um, I, I, every page of this book, I learned something new. Um, so I highly recommend this book. What a cool read. Very cool uh, illustrations. I'm gonna hold this up to the camera um, to illustrate what he's talking about. Hold on here. I just wanna show you a cool illustration. Um, Okay, well, he's talking about changing strings and see those cool images right there. I mean, nothing like a great, well done illustration. So he is talking about everything from, oh, you know, truss rod adjustments, the braces inside the guitar, um, advice on buying a used guitar, uh, the saddle, the nut, all these things that you've heard about, you know, fret work. And um, anyways, I, I can't recommend this book highly enough. Um, Acoustic Guitar Repair Detective by Paul Neary, and his last name is spelled N as in Nancy, E as in Edward, R as in Ringo Starr, I as in I recommend this book. Okay. Thank you for letting me chat a little bit. Still on the agenda, which we'll get to, is uh, a little more discussion of the Circle of Fifths. Uh, I will also share with you shortly um, some times I have available for taking online lessons with me. Um, and I would I'd love to you know, meet you for one-on-one -on -one lesson. I use FaceTime, but I also use Skype and uh, Zoom. And um, you know, some of you actually, I know from the chat, some of you already do online lessons with me. Okay, let's find some more questions from you. Looking for those question marks, I am scrolling. Uh, Dasho mentions that Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker are examples of blues folks who use um, who use their fingers as opposed to pick. Yeah, I, I bet you're right. Looking for those questions. Pooba John, hey Pooba John, welcome back. Pooba John says, how do I know if I'm getting the beat right? It's a, a great question. Uh, um, I'm, I'm always going to recommend that you record yourselves anything you're practicing, anything, anything, anything. Uh, and you have no excuse because uh, I think pretty much every, there's the, there's the picture of the Healy guitar again. Um, every cell phone has that option to record yourself, right? Uh, it's an eye opener. The recording yourself and listening back, it, it can be brutal, right? Because you think you sound so, so, and you find out it doesn't even sound as good as you thought it did. I get it, I get it. Um, it's the equivalent of looking in the mirror before you go out for your hot date, right? You know, you look in the mirror, you don't think about, you gotta, you gotta look in the mirror. To continue the metaphor here, you look in the mirror and sometimes you realize, oh, I can fix the thing in one second. I just need to look in the mirror. Now I can fix it. You will have that experience listening to a playback of yourself. As, as, as humbling as it will be, it's extremely likely that you will hear something and say, oh, I could that I can fix in one second. I didn't know I was doing that. 
you know. Uh, and and I bet you what's also possible, you will something will sound better than you expected. Maybe that one chord change or that one thing will sound better than you thought it did, or it'll sound the way you want it to sound. And you got to give yourself a pat on the back. Okay, so Puba John, to get back to your question, the question is, how do I know if I'm getting the beat right? Record yourself and listen back. That's one option. <clears throat> uh, if you are um, playing a specific song, um, to the best of your ability, play along with the song, if possible. That's not always easy because songs are always faster than you want them to be, right? I know. Uh, but that's another thing. If you can keep up with a song, chances are you've got the beat right. Ideally, record yourself playing along with a song, and then you know you can hear. Well, it does my guitar fit with that? But that brings me to the big one: the M word, metronome. Playing with a metronome, uh, also a humbling experience. Um, the metronome is always right, and you're always wrong. So there you go. Uh, but um, the metronome is another tool in your toolbox that we all should be using. Um, I've heard plenty of professional musicians say that they say, I do not practice without a metronome. I don't practice anything without a metronome clicking along. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. The exception would be as you first get to know a piece of music, um, that it, it might be inappropriate to put that kind of pressure on yourself, that clicking metronome. Um, but even if you don't use a metronome as part of your daily practice on every single thing you practice. A metronome is another tool to see if you're getting the beat right. Uh, so those are some general answers, you know. Uh, you could always ask someone, but like I always say, you want to ask a stranger, you know. Your loved ones love you, and and they, they want to support you. Ask a stranger, <laughs> and a stranger will tell you, you know, if you got the beat right. Okay, let's see how we're doing. Uh, Scrolling, scrolling. Walter says, should you sing with your playing to help keep time? Maybe, maybe. Um, in general, I'm a big fan of singing while you play. Uh, you, unless it gets in the way of your guitar progress. As a community right here at this moment, we are here, we are gathered here today <laughs> as guitar players. Let us bow our heads. <laughs> Um, but all many of us, including me, want, want to sing and play at the same time, right? So uh, you, the more confident you are with the guitar part, whatever the guitar part happens to be, the easier it's going to be to sing along. I don't care who you are. You know, you want to be competent and confident and consistent in the guitar playing um, because that makes the singing easier, right? Because you don't have to devote 100% of your brain cells to accomplishing the guitar part. Uh, so my advice is give it a shot, singing and playing at the same time, give it a shot. If it goes well or, or it doesn't seem to interfere, awesome, keep doing it. Um, but if it seems to interfere with your guitar playing, yeah, then maybe put it aside for the moment, you know. Uh, what I like about this question is a million years ago, I read a book the Inner Game of Tennis. There's a bunch of these books, Inner Game of Golf, Inner Game of whatever. Or the one I read was The Inner Game of Music. But it's from that series. I think that's what it was called. And it made a point I've never forgotten, which is, if you ask your body to do multiple things while you're playing your song, an example would be tapping your foot while you're playing the song, you will actually do better. How about tapping your foot and nodding your head? How about tapping your foot, nodding your head and counting out loud, you know, one and two and as you're playing. The notion is that you are focusing so intently on these multiple, multiple but related tasks that you don't have time to be distracted by anything else. Right? <laughs> like when I rode a motorcycle, I was so tense about not dying on my motorcycle that I didn't have time to worry about taxes, <laughs> bills, other stuff. 
So in a way, it was a relaxing motorcycle ride, although my shoulders were like way up by my ears. Um, but it got my mind off of other stuff because I didn't want to die. So my point is singing and playing at the same time. I'm reminded of this thing about multitasking. Is it possible that singing and playing at the same time will actually help you focus and you'll play the guitar better because more of your brain is engaged? Yeah, I want to believe that. Put it that way. I want to believe that it will help. So maybe, maybe. Okay, looking for some more questions. Uh, by the way, hey, beginner guitar, um, sent in a super chat. Folks, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, those of you who send in a super chat. Um, it's a way to, to support what I'm doing here today. Um, and if you have a question that you want to make sure I see, if you do it via a super chat, which is that little dollar sign uh, down at the bottom of the live chat, then I see your question in a big colorful box on my screen, which you guys can probably see as well. Uh, Dan Keck says, Gordon Lightfoot said he would watch football and play a pattern he wanted to get great at. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I, I've, I've definitely had students who say, oh, I put on the ball game, I turn down the volume and just repeat this thing over and over and over again. And um, two things happen. Uh, you get good at that pattern and you annoy everyone in your household. So, hey, two things for the price of one. Um, but yeah, okay. I'm scrolling. I like reading your comments too, everybody. I'm trying to do a combination of looking for questions and also uh, reading comments. Um, let's see here. I, I, I love seeing all these chats. Um, um, I'm going to skip down to Scott Rhodes' questions. Uh, teachers love metronomes. Am I building the same skills if I play with a drum machine instead? 100%. 100%. Yeah. Drum machine. It's, a, it's the same thing if you think about it, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, um, William asks, what would be a good first electric guitar? Uh, it's a great question. <clears throat> oh, and that leads me to a second point. So I'm going to answer your question and... and uh, throw some more information out there. Um, good first electric guitars. Uh, number one, set a budget for yourself. You know what your budget will allow for. Um, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, you know, in that ballpark, uh, it's common for some manufacturers to have a package deal. Electric guitar, small electric guitar amplifier and the cable to collect it, uh, connect it all as one package. Um, because I'm not feeling the love for a certain guitar company right now, I'm going to say, you know who makes great beginner guitars? Epiphone. Epiphone. E-P-I-P-H-O-N-E. Epiphone makes great beginner guitars. And uh, you know who else makes great beginner guitars? Yamaha. Yamaha makes great stuff. Um, so those are two great brands. And in both cases, you may well find... Um, a package deal where you have everything you need all in one package. Uh, um, here's why I'm glad you asked that question, uh, William. So I, I have become a partner with um, our friends over at Sweetwater.com. We all love Sweetwater.com, right? Sweetwater is like Amazon, but for musicians. Um, Sweetwater and I are working together where I am an affiliate and I get affiliate links to click on. What does that mean? Well, I'm not set up to do it today, but imagine William uh, goes to buy a guitar, but instead of William at the end of our, our, our uh, live stream here, he goes to his computer and types in sweetwater.com and shops and buys a guitar. Imagine if instead William goes to say uh, the description of this live stream right now, and in it, there's a Sweetwater link to click on. He clicks on that link to Sweetwater, and that takes him to this exact same website. He buys the same guitar, life is good. But Mr. Teacher here gets a teeny tiny percentage of William's purchase. I get a teeny tiny kickback from Sweetwater. It's called an affiliate link. Some of you may well be aware of this, right? So that's something that I've been working on with Sweetwater. They've checked me off, they've approved me um, to do this. And uh, so, um, Look, look for that in the future. 
there may be times on a show, on a program like this, where I'll say, oh, you know, th that's something you could probably get from Sweetwater. And by the way, if you choose to do that, if you're going to buy it from them anyways, do it through, through the link at the bottom of this video or whatever. And then I, I get a tiny percentage. Um, you know, I, I have no problem recommending Sweetwater because they're so easy to do business with. The only thing you can say negative about Sweetwater is their huge success which they've earned because they run a great business in my, in my experience um, comes at the price of all the mom and pop guitar stores um, and music stores. That's a big price. That's, I, I grew up going to every little music store I could find. Um, it's, it's the world we live in right now. Okay. Uh, so I am scrolling my friends. If I miss your question, bear with me, folks, because I I love all of them and I don't want to miss any of them. So I scroll up and then I scroll back down. Um, Dwayne is looking for some simple song recommendations. And um, I have a few favorites, but folks, if you have simple songs, and I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest for those of you in our little community, we have uh, 46 people watching right now. That's awesome. Uh, let's say sim sim songs with simple chords and simple strumming. The ones I always suggest <clears throat> are uh, Free Fallen, good old Tom Petty, Free Fallen. Uh, you Can't Always Get What You Want by the Rolling Stones, which relies on an F chord, but um, you can use a capo and avoid the F chord uh, and still play along with the original, you can't always go what you want, uh, um, recording. Because to me, that's the best. That's the ultimate goal. Whether you're talking about a simple song, a not so simple song, the ultimate goal is to play along with the original recording. Um, it doesn't get any better than that, right? Uh, I have a video on, you can't, I have both of those songs. I have videos on my YouTube channel on how to play those songs, um, including with you can't always get what you want, how to avoid the F chord. I know we all should master the F chord. I hope you do. In the meantime, there's no reason why you can't play along with a song um, and learn other skills while you're simultaneously or, or separately working on mastering the F chord. But those are just uh, songs that pop up off the top of my head. I would love to hear what you guys recommend for songs with simple strumming and simple so have have that everybody put it in the chat <clears throat> okay yeah uh, Dan yeah Dan mentioned that he practices every day if you only have 10 minutes you only have 10 minutes yeah if I'm watching TV trying to get my alternating thumb on uh, automatic but it's still every day yeah 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 okay scrolling scrolling my friends Scott says, Scott says, I wish I had learned your style of G first. I'm having trouble retaining muscle memory from the typical G. Do you have any tips? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so here's what Scott is talking about. Uh, wow, we're one hour into the show. How did that happen? How did that, I haven't even had a drink of water yet. Hold on. Okay. Uh, Scott is talking about I'm going to call this my G because I don't have another name for it. And I take the blame for any of you who are frustrated with this way of doing G. I'll take the blame for it. Scott's referring to a G major chord where your ring finger is on the fat string third fret, your middle finger on the fifth string second fret, and your pinky skinny string third fret. No index finger whatsoever. And this is a hard way of doing G. For most human beings, and it's not an intuitive way of doing G. Because think about it, I'm not using my most confident finger. Okay, so why would anyone recommend doing G this way? And how do you get good at it? <clears throat> I'll keep this quick because I feel like I might have mentioned this in a previous live stream. So, but here's the thing: many chords that partner well with a G require your index finger to be somewhere around the first fret. It could be a chord that commonly comes right before G or commonly comes right after G, and it requires your index finger to be, you know, like I said, hovering around the first fret somewhere. An example would be 
a, a C chord, an A minor chord, a D7 chord, an F chord. All those chords I just mentioned involve the index finger being on the first fret of either the first string or second string or both. Uh, G7 is another one that comes to mind. All chords that partner very commonly with a G major chord. So how do you get good at doing this G? Um, number one, desire, just wanting to, you know, having the right attitude saying, darn it, I'm going to do this, whatever it takes right there. You're, you've already, you're 86% of the way there just by wanting it. Okay. My advice is uh, four strums on G followed by four strums on any of the chords I just mentioned. I'm going to use C major as an example. Here's my four G's and four C's. As long as you can take it. Oh, by the way, a song that uses um, G and C over and over and over again. I believe it's the John Denver song called uh, Sun Sunshine on My Shoulders. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah. So I think, um, I mean, I know there's a John Denver song called Sunshine on My Shoulders. I think that's the one where a, a huge part of the song, I mean, it's it's relying on G and C back and forth over and over and over again. Um, don't take my word for it. You can Google it. I don't know if there's a capo involved. I just remember finding it remarkable. Like, whoa, wait a minute. There's an example of G and C over and over again. Instead of just telling someone, hey, go practice G and C, I could say, oh, well, let's work on Sunshine on my shoulder, sunshine on your shoulder, and uh, and then it won't feel so much like an exercise. As much as possible in my teaching, I try to connect any skill with some famous song. Um, number one, it makes it more fun. Number two, if the skill is so important, shouldn't there be an example of a real guitar player employing that skill out there somewhere in the universe, right? Because if it's so important, um, hey, Mr. Smart Teacher, give me an example of a real guitar player using that important skill. That's a little extra motivation to get good at that skill. You could do G to A minor, G to D7. Um, hey, G to F, you're killing two birds with one stone. You're getting better at this G and better at an F chord, you know. Uh, so there's some examples. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Oh, real quick, nothing wrong with, let's call this the intuitive G chord, where you do use your index, middle, and ring. Nothing wrong with that G whatsoever. It's just not a practical choice um, for a lot of situations, right? Because your index finger is hung up here on the second fret when it's extremely likely that the very next chord relies on you completely rotating your hand. To those of you who listen to this as a podcast someday, when I turn these into podcasts, I know you can't see my left hand, but for those of you who are watching, you can see how I'm playing my G chord, this uh, intuitive G, let's call this the normal G. And now when I go to C, I'm going to do this in slow motion, watch my wrist and arm and everything, look how much rotating I'm doing. Can I do it? Sure, I can, but in my heart of hearts, I know it's I'm wasting energy. Uh, here's a little fun uh, game that you can play. <laughs> Next time you're watching any guitar player, but especially the acoustic guitar player, singer, songwriter, people who are likely to play a lot of these most common chords, watch to see how they're doing G. You can see it a mile away. If they're doing G with your index, middle, and ring, it's extremely likely that the next chord will require them to profoundly, fundamentally change their wrist and arm. I've seen perfectly talented singer-songwriters play G with their index, middle, and ring, and then very calmly and naturally change to C in what I would consider, which anyone would consider, to be an inefficient way of going to a C chord. Or, in, you know, get what I'm saying? As opposed to, take a look, everybody, Jonathan's G, the hard G, the less intuitive G, the G without employing your index finger, middle ring and pinky, to C. You see how subtle that is? Some of you might not even believe I'm doing a C chord. You can barely, you, can, you know, it doesn't, I'm not even moving that much. It's worth the effort. You will never regret mastering both ways of doing the G. Okay. Uh, okay, as promised, let me throw this out there while I have the attention of 47 of you. Awesome. Okay. Those of you who may consider 
doing some online guitar lessons with me, um, let me tell you, I would love it. Not all 47 of you or 44 at the moment, not all of you, but Monday mornings, I have time on Monday mornings. Uh, I'm in the East Coast. So adjust your mental framework, right? Right now, for instance, on the East Coast, it is 6.05 p.m. But if any of you would like Monday morning uh, guitar lessons or Monday morning or Tuesday, like lunchtime or early, early afternoon, I'll put this in the chat, or Friday morning, okay? Monday morning, Tuesday, I'll say early afternoon. I'll tell you how you can get in touch with me in a second. Tuesday afternoon, or what else did I say? Friday morning online. What I don't have available is uh, what I call the after school and early evening hours. Um, because those are the, the big desirable times. Um, okay. If you're interested, first of all, thank you for your interest. Um, and I'm including in the chat how to get a hold of me. Lessons. I like using FaceTime because I don't, we don't have to make an appointment. <laughs> Just FaceTime, you know. Um, same thing with Skype. Uh, and Zoom cuts me off after 40 minutes. These are 45 minute lessons that I offer and Zoom likes to cut me off after 40 minutes. I'm like, uh, I don't know. But anyways, but I'm happy to use all these. FaceTime, Zoom, Skype. Uh, typically you pay for the lessons using Venmo, which is my favorite, or PayPal. Sometimes PayPal takes a little bite out of the amount, which is not fair. Since Venmo doesn't take a bite, I kind of like Venmo a million times better. Um, and what we try to do is, is, what we do is we find a time that works for both of us, uh, Mondays, 9 a.m. And uh, what I ask is that we do it, we make a commitment. So it's not like, hey, I'm going to do one Monday. And then what I'm looking for, or what I was looking for, is people who say, hey, look, um, here we are in July. Let's do basically every Monday for, say, the rest of July and August. Like, let's make a commitment to it. Six or seven lessons. <clears throat> um, th that's how I do my job best is when I see someone every week. Every once in a while, someone will say, hey, could I do every other week? Perfectly reasonable request. I, 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 don't, I can't give you my best um, every other week. For financial reasons, I 100% get it. But people will also say, hey, that gives me two weeks to get good at the thing you gave me. I understand that thought process. Um, I, I would much rather load you up with a whole bunch of stuff for eight weekly lessons, and then you go and knock yourself out for however long you want, and then come back for eight more lessons. That's just, I operate better that way. And um, yeah, so for those of you who are watching right now, um, that happens to be what I have in my schedule. Um, and if that works for any of you, I put my email address in the chat. So, so let me know. Okay, thanks for letting me uh, put a little sales pitch out there. Um, scrolling down, looking for some more, uh, some more questions. Uh, uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, Harmonica and guitar progress makes an interesting point. It says I can't remember ever going through a guitar book front to back. It's a resource, but very dry without some audio track. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I, I will sometimes recommend, or I always recommend to students, when you buy a guitar book, very often there's well, it used to be. I remember when there's a little black flexible flexi disc, um, then they move to a cassette tape then a CD. And now very often you have access to an audio track and that's how you can hear the examples from the book. How, whatever is provided with the book and usually nowadays something is provided. I'll tell students, hey, put it on while you're in the car and listen to the audio tracks that go along with the book as you're driving around doing errands or put it on while you're making dinner, whatever, um, and see what jumps out at you. Because uh, I'll give you an example. My book, right? Easy guitar, chord and lead tricks, a guide to elevating your playing. I, that, <laughs> this was Hal Leonard's idea for a title uh, and a subtitle. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, so this comes with uh, access to the audio. 
you could put on this, you know, and listen. And as you're making your French toast, um, I, I predict you'll hear something like, wait, that sounds, I like it. It doesn't sound too hard. What page is that on again? Oh yeah, I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna jump to that page, do that thing. Um, so uh, that's a recommendation, not just for my awesome book from Hal Leonard Publications, uh, available at song-bike.com. <laughs> Uh, but lots of books, you know, this particular book, um, there's no easy, medium, hard, everything is equal and wonderful. And you can kind of jump to anything that strikes your fancy. And especially when, it, when a book is presented that way, um, listening to the audio as you go about your day is a great way to see what appeals to you and, and jump into that. Okay. Uh, Oh, da Dasho, you took you took a lesson with Fred Sokolo. Whoa. Wow. How cool. Um, Dasho, where where was that? I'm just curious. Is is he a New York guy? Is he a LA guy? I'm, I'm kind of curious where Fred, where Fred is. Uh, okay, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Hey, Beginner Guitar, thanks for the super chat. Beginner Guitar is our moderator today, by the way, folks. So uh, he is keeping track of, um, of you guys. Uh, um, you know, if you start talking about, um, I don't know, the stuff that I don't see because he, because he moderates it. Um, uh, so thank you, Beginner Guitar, for, uh, for uh, being here. Okay, looking for those question marks, my friends. Charlie Beagle says... You could use power chords at the third fret for G and C. That would be fast. I'm learning just a little by the Bo Brummels, and there's a G to C section there. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a second. Let's unpack this, as they say. Uh, anytime you're asked to play any chord, you could substitute a power chord instead. What is a power chord? A power chord, how do I not have guitar picks here? I'm literally in a guitar store. I'd have to get up and, and get my guitar picks. Oh, well, let me use my thumb. Uh, a power chord is neither major nor minor. Therefore, a power chord could be substituted for a major or minor chord. Another way of looking at it is if you're playing with someone and they're playing a G chord, regular G major chord, you could play along with them by playing a G power chord for a slightly contrasting sound. If they're playing an A minor chord, you could play an A power chord. So power chords are neither major nor minor. They could, but they can be substituted for a major minor chord, or they could also complement a major minor chord. Okay, I'll do that with my students. If, if I have a student who's strumming a G chord, I'll strum a G power chord along with them just, you know, for the fun of it. And we, we begin this conversation. Okay, so what is a power chord? A power chord is a two note chord, uh, sometimes written with a number five. A G power chord, you'll often see G5. A C power chord, we'll say C5. Why the number five? A little music theory, I'll keep this quick. Uh, the definition of a power chord is two notes. The first note and the fifth note, first note and fifth note of a major scale. So therefore they use the number five as a, as a indication, okay. The most common way of playing a power chord, I'm gonna do a G power chord. Index finger has to be your index finger. Third string, sorry, sorry. Sixth string, fat, E string, third fret. I'll say that again, index finger, fat string, third fret. You wanna get right in the very tip of that finger. Make sure your thumb is pointing up towards the ceiling. Your thumb should be pointing up towards the ceiling, not parallel to the guitar neck like I'm indicating right now. Certainly not poking out on this side of the guitar, right? Sometimes people do that. You might say, why would anyone ever let their thumb come around to, let's call it the front of the guitar neck? Absent-mindedly, I see people do it, just they're not, they're not thinking it's drifting forward like that. No, uh, no shame in that, it happens. We all do goofy stuff. Index finger, six string, third fret, either your ring or your pinky. At first, the ring finger might be like a, a big stretch. You can use your pinky fifth string, fifth fret. Okay, so now I have two fingers. I'm going to use my pinky just to show you there's no shame in using your pinky. Hey, it you gives your pinky a workout. It's more conventional to use your ring finger, but the pinky works. So 
For the record, I have index finger, fat string, third fret, pinky, fifth string, fifth fret. Okay, so I'm on the two adjacent fat strings. With your pick, with your thumb, or how about using your thumb and your index finger in a pinching kind of motion? I'm talking about your right hand now. You want to play just those two strings, the two fat strings, and that is a power chord. At least that's the simplest way of playing a power chord. <clears throat> it's called a G power chord. The name comes from the note your pointer finger is touching. Your pointer finger is touching the note G, therefore this is a G power chord. If I glide this power chord grip up and down the neck, keeping the formation of the fingers the same, the name will no longer be a G power chord. It'll be named after whatever note the pointer finger is touching. G up two frets becomes an A power chord. Up two more frets becomes a B power chord, and so on, okay? Power chords can also be dropped down towards the floor. What am I talking about? Both of my fingers, which are on the sixth and fifth strings, are going to drop down one string towards the floor. My pointed finger is now on the fifth, my pointed finger, yeah, is now on the fifth string, third fret. My pinky is now on the fourth string, fifth fret. I am now going to pluck just those two strings. No more fat string. I'm only going to pluck the two I'm touching, and that is a C power chord. Why is it a C power chord? Because my pointer finger is on the fifth string, third fret, and that is the note C. That's the note that names the power chord. It's a C power chord. So if you came to me for a guitar lesson and you say, hey, Jonathan, I wrote a song. My song goes from G to C, and you were strumming, let's call it the old-fashioned G to C. You're strumming, and you're singing, and you're strumming, and you're singing your G and your C back and forth, right? I would very likely grab a G power chord and when you change to C I change to a C power chord why because it, it's a cool combination you're doing the open position chords some people call those cowboy chords and I'm doing the power chords I'm limited to just two strings but it's a cool sound uh, one reason they are called power chords in case you're wondering played on an electric guitar loud with some distortion, some effects, it's a powerful sound. It's a mighty, mighty, mighty sound. You can't have hard rock, heavy metal, punk. You can't have all that stuff without power chords. There's nothing more powerful than a power chord. Okay. Uh, oh, now is as good a time as any to uh, throw a name out there of a guitar player that I really enjoy. Um, not only listening to what he's capable of on the guitar, but I, I watch interviews with folks on YouTube, and very often I would just put on in uh, an interview with someone and listen to them talk because I like hearing how they think. Um, so in the chat, I'm introducing the name. I'm pretty sure I spelled it right. Uh, Jim Campolongo. Who knows Jim Campolongo, right? Uh, very interesting guy, um, terrific guitar player, based out of New York City. Um, among the many things that he is known for that you may have seen him doing, uh, Nora Jones, remember Nora Jones? You know, don't know why. Uh, Nora Jones has a band called the Little Willies, and he is one of the Little Willies. Um, that's one of the many things that Jim Campolongo is known for. So, hey, add him to your list, especially if you've never heard that name before. Um, watch a couple of videos of him playing, listen to some of his music. And, um, and it's, I, I like watching interviews with him as well. He's an articulate guy, <clears throat> interesting guy. So Jim Campolongo, just want to put that name out there. I, uh, during these live streams, I like taking advantage that, of the fact that there's 45 of you out there. And, and just so you know, these live streams, after you and I are, are done here, and these end up being videos on my YouTube channel, these get hundreds of views, um, possibly by yourself and possibly by you know other people out there. Um, so it makes me feel good to throw some names out there of musicians who you may not be aware of, but now, now you've heard the name. Okay. Let's see. Okay, I'm starting at the bottom and scrolling. Hot Rock 51 just saw Derek Trucks the other night. Um, uh, excellent, excellent. Um, North Country Fishers bring up Circle of Fifths. Yes, yes, we will get to the Circle of Fifths. And to prove it, 
I have my copy handy. Okay, so that'll be the next. Uh, I'm going to look to see if there's any questions I'm missing, and then yes, circle fits time. I have, I have a new thing to throw at you in terms of circle fits. Okay, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, Joseph Galasso, welcome back. I I feel like we I haven't uh, seen you yet today, so nice. Um, oh sure, okay, Dashel, thanks for the information. Um, Fred, uh, um, he was teaching at McCabe's. I take it. Yeah, I, I've heard of McCabe's. And I've heard of Santa Monica. <laughs> uh, not a part of the country I'm super familiar with, but um, but thank you for uh, for for that information. Man, a lesson with Fred Socolo. How cool! I mean, this is this is what guitar teachers geek out about. Other guitar teachers, you know. Um, I just wow, so cool. Um, I see the lesson was on Zoom. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Okay, I'm scrolling up just to make sure that um, Harmonic and Guitar Progress asks, what's the price for lessons? Um, I'm gonna uh, keep that private, not because I wanna be, um, I don't know, not for any negative reason. Here's why. Um, <laughs> uh, Number one, because this video is going to be out there for my lifetime. Uh, that's my intention. And I surely don't want to deal with someone saying, hey, man, you said the price was, you know, 11 bucks. What do you mean it's 14 bucks? Um, so uh, I can tell you my prices are pretty reasonable, um, certainly for, for where I live. I, in fact, I might even be a little bit less than some of the music shops around me. Also, my prices are going up a little bit. <laughs> so no matter what I tell you today, um, probably in September, they're gonna go up uh, a few percentage points. Um, so uh, what I can tell you is it's a perfectly reasonable price. It's not like, uh, hey man, it's a thousand bucks and the, it's gonna be a seven minute lesson. Um, so uh, I, I, again, I apologize for not being more direct about answering the question. I just, eh. It's I, I'm it's not, not particularly expensive and uh, and I'm happy to for anyone who emails me I'm happy to quote you the price by email. What I do what I do want to be clear about is um, if you do me the honor of taking a few lessons with me I do ask that you um, pay in advance for whatever we set up you know so if we set up you know six Mondays and you tell me okay I'm going to miss this one but I can make the next Monday whatever we set up. You pay in advance for those for those weeks. That's how you hold that time. And I am yours. I am yours for those. And if something comes up uh, and you have to miss a lesson, um, to the best of our abilities, we credit you for you know a missed lesson, and we just make up the lesson. I just ask that everyone be cool. You cancel four lessons in a row and come back a year later. You're like, hey man, what about those four lessons that I canceled on you? I want those four lessons. I mean, that's never happened, but we want to avoid that happening, you know? So you look at your schedule and I look at my schedule and say, this is what we can commit to. And then we rock and roll and we we get to the next level of guitar playing. That's the goal. Okay. Uh, okay, so folks, I feel like at the moment, I the feel like at the moment that I... <laughs> 11 to 14 dollars hey a to z me yes that's the goal right i was 11 but now that i'm on youtube it's up to 14 bucks uh when i started teaching guitar in 1992 i was working in a little guitar shop outside chicago and the 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 setup at the shop was 30 minute lessons half hour lessons <clears throat> and i think the price in 1992 was 12 bucks 12, 14 bucks in that ballpark. And I think the teachers, I think we all got maybe nine bucks of that. I mean, I'm, I'm just, these are numbers. You know, we didn't get the whole amount because, you know, the store has overhead, which that's that's fine. That's, But yeah, it, memory serves, you know, 12 or 14 bucks for a half hour lesson. And uh, all of us teachers were down in the basement, down in the basement of this music store, not, not a finished... Not, 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 you know, picture a com commercial real estate basement, not, not hopefully your basement with nice carpeting. And yeah, no, this, this was, uh, 
I paid my dues, man, to the extent that guitar teaching has dues involved. I paid my dues, man. Cranking out 10 half hour lessons in a row. Bam, 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 bam. In a basement. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, I paid my dues, uh, which is why I no longer teach half hour lessons. Because no, you can't half an hour. It's funny. You can get 10 times more done in 45 minutes in a, in a lesson situation, 10 times more than half an hour. I don't know what it is, but half an hour, man, never again. Um, but, but it, that was the game, you know, that's what you signed up for half hour lessons and ew, it, you get stuff done. Um, in fact, a big reason, <laughs> a big reason I wrote this book, I'm holding up easy guitar, accordingly tricks by me. Um, this is how you you teach a half hour lesson, but the student paid for a 45 minute lesson. <laughs> and you think, crap, man, I got to come up with something to, 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 you know, this person paid. I got to give him a 45 minute lesson. This book is full of things that I feel comfortable, you know, I can teach it in eight minutes and then watch you work through it in seven minutes. And we have both fulfilled our duties of a 45 minute lesson. Um, I love this book. Okay. How did I get in this subject? Uh, oh, uh, the price of lessons. Yeah. Back in the day, that's that's when it started. Uh, a Hot Rock 51 says, thank you for doing this. Your videos are so helpful. I may want to take lessons from you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, um, a little update. <clears throat> um, every summer, my family goes to Maine, the beautiful state of Maine for a week. And this year, we are again going to, to Maine. So I reached out to a handful of music stores in the, the area that we're going to. And I said, look, I would uh, love to promote your music shop as a meeting place and say to folks like yourselves and, and uh, other YouTube subscribers, people who know me online, and say, hey, everybody, uh, I'm going to be at this one music shop in Portland, Maine, on a Saturday afternoon for an hour. Come on by and say hi. I'd love to meet you guys face to face. For those of you who might live in Maine, I don't know. It just seemed like there's a. I know there's a few of you who live in Maine out there, and I, it's interesting the responses I've got. Uh, uh, what I'll share with you. I won't name any names yet because I, I want this to work out. I think it's a it's a cool idea. One response I got was, I don't think we want you, Jonathan, visiting our music shop because you're the competition. We have flesh and blood guitar teachers in our music shop, we'd rather not have you coming in promoting your online lessons. So that's that's one response I got. <laughs> Another response I got, which I liked much more, was sounds like a great idea. The only problem is the guitar shop is so small. If there's four people standing around, it's, it's a crowd. Like we can't have six people standing around. It's too small. Um, which you gotta love that. I mean, that's a place I want to go to. What a cool, that's a, you know, who doesn't love small guitar shops? Um, so I don't have anything carved in stone yet. Um, but for those of you who live in Maine, I might also make a stop in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, because we drive through Portsmouth, New Hampshire on our way up and back. And Portsmouth, New Hampshire, what a cool place. Uh, if you've been there, if you haven't been there, what a cool place. So uh, possibly something in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, possibly something in Portland, Maine, or in the vicinity of Portland, Maine. Um, the first week of August, end of July, first week of August. So those of you who live anywhere nearabouts or thereabouts, stay tuned um, because I hope to be able to um, see, say hi to some of you. N nothing, nothing fancy. It's not like I'm gonna. I just want to say hi and uh, and shake some hands and um, hang out. So uh, so stay tuned. One way I'll be making that information public is on social media. So. Um, everybody just put my name into Instagram or Facebook. If you don't already follow me on Instagram or Facebook, just type my name in and I will pop up or actually even better search for song bike. Cause I would just as soon have you guys follow me on, on my song bike page as opposed to my, my personal page. Okay, I'm putting it into the chat right now, um, because then uh, you'll be the first to know um, whichever one of these music stores would allow me to, well, in my mind, I'm promoting the music store. I'm saying, hey, you know, it's an awesome place in Portland, Maine. 
fill in the blank. And it's so awesome that I can't wait to meet you at that guitar store. And while you're there, hey, why don't you support them by buying some strings and picks and maybe even buying a sweet guitar, you know, whatever. So I don't know, to me, it's a win-win situation. Um, I have a feeling uh, that, you know, there's just gonna be a few of us, right? Because most of you don't live in Maine or New Hampshire. But hey, you know what? Let's hang out and, and drink coffee <laughs> and, and talk about guitars and, and buy stuff. Uh, my home base, Sam asks what my home base was. Sam, you're talking to me. My home base is Connecticut. The great state of Connecticut is where I live. Small town, Connecticut, what I call the Connecticut River Delta because I live very close, generally speaking, uh, to where the Connecticut River runs south and joins the Long Island Sound, the Connecticut River Delta. I may be the only person who refers to it as the Connecticut River Delta, but it makes me laugh because, you know, there's the, the Mississippi River Delta, home of the blues, all that, you know. Then there's the Connecticut River Delta. <laughs> um, has its own charm, I'm sure. Uh, beginning Guitar says, if I ever come to Louisiana, you have a place for me. Well, thank you, number one. Uh, I, I'll take you up on that someday. Number two, I went to New Orleans. Uh, it was, a, I went to New Orleans in 2000. It was before Katrina. Um, man, I had such a good time in New Orleans, just for purely musical reasons. I, I, I'm not sure why I don't live in New Orleans. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would, I, I took it since, since we're on the subject of, of New Orleans, <clears throat> I hopped on a train in Chicago, took a, an overnight train to Chicago. Remember that song, the city of New Orleans, right? What a great song. An overnight train. I went to, you know, got on the train 8 p.m. in Chicago, woke up as the sun was coming up. I think I woke up in the train was in Mississippi, watched the sunrise in Mississippi. And by the time we were in New Orleans, I thought to myself, man, I've already got my money's worth. It's already just about the best vacation I've ever been on. Just, just the train trip alone. Holy cow. And then I got off the train in New Orleans and had an amazing time in New Orleans, just for purely musical reasons. I mean, I had I had good food, you know, good weather, but man, I loved it. Um, and uh, for those of you, I don't know if we have any New Orleans um, uh, viewers at the moment amongst the 47 of you uh, right now, uh, got some great burritos in New Orleans. And then when I hopped on the train to go back to Chicago at the end of the trip, I got a few of the burritos to eat on the train. Juan's, was it called Juan's Famous Burritos? Juan's something, Juan's something burritos in New Orleans. Man, were they good. Oh, man. So, yeah. Yeah, someday, someday. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm reading your chats here, reading your chats. Uh, Susan says, hey, Jonathan. Hey, Susan, how are you? Are we on this Tuesday, Susan? Speaking of, uh, of online students, Susan, I think we're on, uh, we're on for this, uh, this Tuesday.